In the past several years, the nature of the kinds of optics we can work with has been changing, and it's been changing quite radically. This has started with emerging changes in technology, especially in nanotechnology and in silicon photonics. But as we've started to exploit that technology, we've created optics and optical systems that are quite radically different, possibly almost unrecognisable compared to what we're used to. This means we have to look at optics quite differently, and we need new tools and concepts. These tools and concepts have actually been emerging progressively. With hindsight, we can see the roots of these ideas some 20 years ago, but these have advanced dramatically over the past several years. The cumulative effect is that we need to reset how we think about optics. Now, the good news is that the concepts we need have clarified considerably in recent years, so that they start to form quite a coherent whole. It's the purpose of this talk to introduce some of these ideas and how we can work with them to create a whole new generation of optical devices and systems. Now, we are all very used to the ideas of optics being lenses and mirrors and prisms and gratings, and those remain very useful ideas to this day, of course. We added into these the ideas of resonators and optical fibres in the 1960s and 1970s, and those added the idea of modes into optics, and that's something we'll come back to. But with this new technology, we've started to get, first of all, lithography giving us diffractive optical elements, and we've had those for some time, and display technology gave us the spatial light modulator, which was our first major programmable component in optics. And that enabled many laboratory experiments and demonstrations and quite practical adaptive optics with working real-time algorithms. So we are starting to see the programmability and the algorithms coming into optics. But more recently, we've seen very high complexity in optical systems and devices. For example, in metasurfaces. These are objects that go well beyond the simpler diffractive optics and can have very high complexity and sub-wavelength features. And then a completely different concept has been emerging over the past several years, the last decade approximately, and that's complex integrated photonic circuits, for example, in silicon photonics. And this example here, which is one of many that have been demonstrated, consists, as you can see, of some complicated optics with multiple fibres coming in and multiple fibres coming out, and a silicon photonic circuit in the middle that has a very large number of components yet it does something interesting and useful. Especially over the last decade or so, we've started to see quite complex photonic circuits. And these circuits have architectures to them that are also complex. And those architectures can support specific classes of algorithms, giving, for example, highly complex, completely self-configuring circuits. This again is quite different from the optics we're used to before. Here, for example, is one such circuit. This is an interferometer mesh, and it automatically separates overlapping light beams without loss. The overlapping light beams come from some fibers here, coupled into these waveguides, and they're all mixed up in this particular region. And then this mesh of interferometers separates them all out again. It does this automatically. There are many such circuits now and they can perform remarkably complex functions. As I said, this is introducing new ideas of architectures and algorithms in complex circuits. For a recent review, see this paper with Wim Bogertz as the first author that summarizes much of this work. I mentioned earlier that once we introduced resonators and waveguides, we started introducing the idea of modes into optics. And these days, we're really very interested in extending this idea for example, we might want to use multiple modes or beam shapes as different channels in waveguides or free space to carry information separately on those channels. Those waveguides and free space systems could have various different shapes of beam, and I've just shown a few of the possibilities here in one particular system. But this introduces a very interesting question about what exactly we mean by modes, and we will come back to that. In fact, we'll have to look at that rather differently. We can see that these many ideas and many others, especially complex circuits and nanophotonic systems, start to look less and less like the classical optics of lenses and mirrors. 
and in many cases they do not even simply have the character of being multiple planes of optics separated by space. This raises the question of whether we need some new intellectual tools for working in these emerging fields, some new ways of looking at optics that encompass the earlier optics but can also conveniently handle these new kinds of systems. Essentially, we may need to rewrite optics. Now, of course, I can't cover all of these ideas in this talk, so I've picked a few of them, but the ones I've picked are actually very closely related and interlinked, and they're rather broad in their applicability. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at complex programmable photonic circuits, those ones based on meshes of interferometers. One reason for doing this is that these are possibly the most radically different kind of idea for optical systems among those that we've been discussing. And so if we can handle these, we may be able to handle some rather different kinds of concepts in optics. And again, this review that I mentioned is a good introduction to this particular field. The second thing I'm going to talk about is what I'm calling here the right way to describe optics in terms of modes. And that can handle surface-to-surface -surface optics, and it will resolve paradoxes of the numbers of channels there, but it can also work with objects or optical systems of arbitrary shapes. And it's also fully compatible with the ideas of complex photonic circuits. This is summarized quite completely in this article. And as I said, this turns out to be rather a different idea and quite a different concept of modes from the ones we've been using up to this point. I'm going to start by illustrating what I mean by an arbitrary linear optical system. This goes quite beyond what we can do with simple plane-to-plane -plane optics. As I do this, I will also constructively illustrate the ideas of arbitrary linear optics based on interferometer meshes and introducing some of the main concepts there. After that, we'll look at how we can properly handle the ideas of spatial channels in optical communication quite generally and also the complete description of linear optical devices and scatterers. And both of these will be in terms of modes, but those modes will be rather different to what we're used to. These two problems also turn out to be very closely related and to use the same mathematics for these modes. Let's start by looking at a problem that we could not solve before. How would you separate two or more overlapping light beams, that is, one right on top of the other, but of different shapes, but without fundamental loss, especially when those shapes are relatively arbitrary. To lay the groundwork here, let's start by thinking about the simple optical components we often work with, which are characterized by a surface with some properties. To understand what I mean here, let's look at designing some very simple optical components. We'll start with a mirror. We design, as it were, a plane mirror by choosing its angle, so that it takes a beam of one angle and changes it into a beam of another angle. For another beam at yet another angle, the mirror changes it to a beam of yet another angle. But we have no independent control over what happens for that second beam. Similarly, we design a lens by choosing its index and its curvatures so that it takes a plane wave in one direction and focuses it to a spot. For another plane wave in another direction, the lens focuses it to another spot, which is very useful, but we have no independent control over what happens for that second beam. This kind of behaviour is general for what we could think of as thin optical components, such as thin holograms, diffractive optical elements, spatial light modulators, adaptive optics, or metasurfaces. We design them to perform some useful function for one input beam, but we have no independent control of what happens for other beams. So these are not arbitrary optical components. Arbitrary optical components would allow us separately to choose what happens for each different input. Suppose we have two different beams, for example, from an optical fiber. Perhaps one has a single bump in it, and perhaps another has two bumps in it. Mathematically, two non-zero beams are orthogonal if this kind of integral between the two fields or beams comes to zero. 
Here, the product of the single bump beam and the two bump beam would be negative in the top half and positive in the bottom half. And hence, the resulting integral would indeed be zero. If both of these beams emerge simultaneously from the fiber, how can we separate them? For example, to different fibers. And it's particularly important to understand how we would do this without fundamental loss. So here we have our single bumped beam coming into our hypothetical device here, and it comes out the top as some kind of beam. And then here is our two bumped beam coming in and it is to come out as some kind of beam, but now out of the bottom, so it's clearly separated from the other one. And if we come in with a linear superposition of these, we want them to come out separately here. The components should be separate. In situations with fixed or highly symmetric beams, we do actually have some ways of doing this that can work with fairly low loss. But for general cases of lower symmetry and or higher complexity, such as this pair of beams here, which can in fact superpose to give us this beam at a particular phase of the superposition of these, how would we make a device to separate out those two, with this one coming out as a beam here and this one coming out as a beam there? These beams are indeed orthogonal, by the way. And even worse would be if we had beams that changed in time general solutions to this problem have really not been known. One approach is to divide the beam into patches. So we can presume that it will be good enough to imagine that we can divide the beam into a finite number of patches. We treat each of these patches as if it was approximately uniform in intensity and in phase. And at least with a sufficiently large number of patches, this could be a good enough approximation and the loss associated with this sampling could be made small enough. Even with relatively small numbers of patches, we are able to distinguish beams of low or moderate complexity. For example, this number of patches would obviously distinguish these two, but even this smaller number would be sufficient. But still, even in principle, how can we separate these beams? To see this, we need to look at a way of building optical systems out of interferometers. And let's start now by looking at a simple so-called Mach-Zender interferometer and let's see how we can build up useful circuits by combining them. Consider a waveguide Mach-Zender interferometer formed from two 50-50 beam splitters, that is equal beam splitters, and at least two phase shifters. One phi to control the relative phase of the two inputs and a second theta to control the relative phase on the interferometer arms. Suppose we shine mutually coherent light into both interferometer inputs, with possibly different amplitudes and phases. We can adjust phi to minimize the power at, say, the bottom output. The fields from the two inputs are now in antiphase, they're in opposite phase at the bottom output. Adjusting theta sets the split ratio of the Mach sender, that is, how the power from one input would be split between the outputs. Interestingly, for 50-50 beam splitters, adjusting theta does not change the relative phase with which the two inputs mix at an output. That is controlled only by phi. So, since we have already minimized the bottom output power by adjusting phi, if we now adjust theta, we will be able to minimize that power to zero because the contributions from the two inputs are already in antiphase at the bottom output and it's always possible therefore to find some ratio of these two contributions that is exactly equal and opposite. So in a Mach sender with 50-50 beam splitters for any relative input amplitudes and phases we can null out the power at the bottom output by two successive single parameter power minimizations, first using phi and second using theta. Now we can take the next step, which is to combine multiple interferometers, for example, in a chain or diagonal line. So here we have a diagonal line of three Mach senders, one here, one here, and one here, 
we have four input waveguides with light shining into each one of them, all mutually coherent, and we have one waveguide at the right where we hope to look for the output. We also have three detectors here. So we start by minimizing the power in detector D1, this one here, by adjusting the corresponding phi and then the corresponding theta. Putting all the power now in the upper output of this mark sender. And that changes the power in the output at the far right at the top. Then we minimize the power in detector D2, that's this one here, by adjusting the corresponding phi and the corresponding theta. Again, to put all the power in the upper output now of this mark sender, which also changes the power at the top right. Finally, we minimize the power in detector D3, this one here, by adjusting the corresponding phi and then the corresponding theta to put all the power, now the total input power, in the upper output. So we could, for example, have grating couplers that couple some free space beam shining onto the top of this chip on the right here to a set of waveguides. Then, using our algorithm, we could automatically couple all the power from those grating couplers to the one output guide on the top right. This could run continuously, tracking changes in the beam and still putting all the power in the output. This self-aligning beam coupler is an interesting device in itself. Obviously, it can align itself to couple a beam, but it has several other possible uses. For example, it can track an input source by continuing to align itself, both in angle and incidentally in focusing. It can correct for aberrations. It can analyze amplitude and phase of the components of a beam, and it has several other possible uses. But how does it help us separate beams? Once we have aligned beam 1 to output 1 using detectors D11 to D13, that is these detectors here working with this diagonal line of mark senders, an orthogonal input beam 2 would pass entirely into the detectors D11 to D13. None of it would appear at the output. That is, if at the input, instead of the vector of amplitudes we originally shone in, that we use to align all of that power to this output. If we shone in a vector of amplitudes that was mathematically orthogonal to the first one, none of it would appear out here. And indeed, if it did, it would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So all of the power in this second beam now will actually pass into these detectors. If we make these detectors mostly transparent, all of this second beam would actually pass into the second diagonal row, that is, this diagonal row of Mach's enders, where we could self-align it to output 2 using power minimization in these two detectors. This would separate two overlapping orthogonal beams to separate outputs, which actually is something that we really did not know how to do before. Adding more rows and self-alignments separates a number of orthogonal beams equal to the number of beam segments, here four, the four waveguides. If we now put identifying tones on each orthogonal input beam, that is a small modulation at some frequency, for example, and we have the corresponding diagonal row of detectors look just for that tone, then the mesh can continually adapt to the orthogonal inputs, even when they are all present at the same time, and even if they change. And this is exactly what my colleagues at the Politecnico di Milano did. They took four separate fibre inputs and combined them in a multi-mode mixer so that when they came out, they were completely mixed up. But they had put identifying tones on each of these input fibres and by using those tones to pull out specific inputs when configuring using these detectors, they were able to separate out all of the beams again, even though they were completely mixed here. And incidentally, if they changed the multi-mode mixing here by heating up this multi-mode mixer, the system would reconfigure automatically to separate the beams out again.
Note this system is an example of exactly what we discussed at the beginning, an optical component that allows us to choose exactly what we do with each different, and technically orthogonal, input. We can choose any mapping we like between the inputs and the outputs. The circuits we have discussed allow any unitary, or essentially lossless, optical function, equivalent to any unitary matrix between the inputs and outputs. This is quite beyond what we could do before with optics, where we were restricted to specific mappings, such as imaging or Fourier transforms. Extensions of the ideas presented here can implement any linear transform, including non-unitary ones. These circuits are very well suited for implementation using silicon photonics, allowing much more complex circuits than we can otherwise imagine. Now we can make circuits with hundreds of interferometers and have them do what we want, which historically would have been quite impossible. Who would have wanted to try to align a hundred interferometers? There are many possible applications and extensions of these ideas, and we've mentioned some of them already. Self-aligning beam couplers, tracking sources, automatic separation of modes you've seen. As I said, automatic analysis of the full amplitude and phase of an input field. Correcting imperfections and removing aberrations. Phase conjugation is another thing these can do. They can undo scattering, including potential real-time self-configuration for undoing atmospheric turbulence, for example, or mode scattering in fibres. They can find the best channels for communications. These circuits can form self-calibrating, self-correcting and self-stabilising complex optical systems. They can calibrate and program other optical circuits and architectures. They can perform arbitrary linear transforms. They can solve mathematical equations. They can make linear optical quantum circuits, optical neural networks, RF photonic circuits, and they allow new ways of sensing where we look for the features we want and can adapt and program those to the application. This is sometimes called super pixels, and one possible application of that is microscopy. These circuits we've been looking at are examples of a new class of photonic systems that we could call programmable photonics. This is a whole new field of optics, and it joins new insights into optical systems and the technology capable of substantial complexity with architectures and algorithms capable of exploiting and controlling that complexity. These programmable circuits we've been looking at are certainly optics, but they're not like the optics of lenses and mirrors, and they are also much more complex than just simple waveguides or even multiple mode waveguides. Does this mean we need another way of looking at optics? And does that have to be incompatible with how we look at more conventional optics? We do need a new way of looking at optics, but it turns out that the answer not only gives us a good way of working with these new optical systems and devices, it arguably turns out to give us a better way of looking at the optics we currently have. This new way of looking at optics reproduces existing results, such as the limits from diffraction. It also resolves paradoxes about the number of channels for communication with optics. It clearly defines these channels. And it also gives us new physical laws, laws that only apply when we take this view. An example is new Kirchhoff radiation laws that we simply did not have before, and a new version of Einstein's A and B coefficient argument, a modal version of it that is actually much simpler. As I've hinted already, this new approach is based on a kind of modes. We like ideas of modes because they can be very economical. We may just need a few mode amplitudes, for example, instead of the field at every point to describe what's going on. But as I've also hinted, this new modal approach is not the same as the ones we may be used to. There are many ways we're used to thinking about optics. We have ray optics, we have imaging optics, we have Fourier optics, where we start to bring in the wave nature of light, and all the way at the other end we have full electromagnetic simulation of electromagnetic fields. In between these we have ideas of modes. We see modes in resonator modes, we see them in waveguide modes, and also to some extent in beams or different kinds of beams. 
but this part of optics is slightly less clear than the others. We want some kind of modal optics to give us the right way to describe optical systems, the optimal sets of functions which might even have basic physical laws that apply only to them, and that give us the most economical way to describe systems, including the right number of the right functions. To do this properly, we need to move beyond the resonator and waveguide modes that we're used to, however, and even beyond the ideas of beams that we like to think of. We are used to modes for resonators, such as a mass on a spring resonator or a standing wave resonator, and for propagating modes in waveguides. We like modes because they are economical. We can use a few mode amplitudes, not fields at every point, and we can often count modes meaningfully. Modes have very useful mathematical properties, for example, orthogonality and completeness. And we can give a definition of a mode. A mode is an eigenfunction of an eigenproblem describing a physical system. But when we look generally at communicating with waves, or scatterers or optical devices or nanostructures between some source and receiving volume, we need a different kind of mode that looks at these source or input spaces and receiving or output spaces. They are modes in two spaces, not one space. They are not the beams between the spaces. To set up the mathematics of this problem, we consider two spaces. First of all, a source or input volume or space. And this space can contain the possible source functions. And we'll write these using a Dirac notation for convenience, as I've shown here for this function psi s, so representing some source. Similarly, we will have a receiving or output volume vr, which will contain the possible wave functions. And again, we will write those functions using a Dirac notation for convenience. Here, phi r. The sources in the input space give waves in the receiving space through some coupling operator, which we'll call GSR here. For free space, this would be based on a free space Green's function, such as a scalar monochromatic Green's function like this one here. And what a Green's function does is it gives the wave at some point RR in the receiving space that results from the point source at RS in the source space. Now, we want eigenproblems to get modes, but we need two eigenproblems because we have two different spaces. And these are not, therefore, just the usual eigenproblems of, say, a resonator in each volume. There is, however, a key mathematical trick we can use instead. With the coupling operator GSR between the spaces, for the source space, we can solve the eigenproblem for this different operator, the product of G dagger SR and GSR. The solutions to this eigenproblem give us an orthogonal set of source functions, so psi SJ, in this Hilbert space HS. Incidentally, the Hermitian adjoint of GSR as a matrix would be the complex conjugate of the transpose of GSR. And as a Green's function, it's a complex conjugate with the source and receiver points interchanged. With the coupling operator GSR between the spaces, for the receiving space, we solve the different eigenproblem for the operator GSR, G dagger SR. So we've swapped them around in order here. So we solve that to get an orthogonal set of wave functions, phi RJ, that are in this other receiving Hilbert space HR. Note incidentally that these two problems have the same positive eigenvalues, the modulus squared of this number SJ. Now, when we have solved these two problems, we find that if we operate on one of these source eigenfunctions, psi SJ, with the coupling operator GSR, we get SJ times the corresponding one of the receiving eigenfunctions, phi RJ. So the source eigenfunction generates the corresponding eigenfunction as the wave in the receiving space with this coupling amplitude SJ. Therefore, we have established the communication mode pairs of functions. 
Note that, by our definition of modes that we gave earlier on, each one of these two sets of functions, the source functions psi sj and the received wave functions phi rj, is a set of modes. The modes in one space are paired with those in the other. In practice, we only have to solve one of the two eigenproblems. We can deduce the solutions to the other one from, for example, GSR operating on psi sj gives us sj times phi rj. This mathematical process is actually the singular value decomposition of the operator GSR. For any linear operator we can think of, D, which we may think of as a matrix for convenience, at least as long as it is bounded, that is, it has a finite output for a finite input, we can perform the singular value decomposition. That is, we can write it in one of the following two equivalent forms. Here, as a product of operators, which again we can think of as matrices, and here involving the functions. These are exactly the same, by the way. U and V here are unitary operators, that is, power-conserving operators, if you like. D diagonal here is a diagonal operator with the elements S, M. And these are called the singular values. The Psi, M are the columns of U, and the Phi, M are the columns of V. Note that for the matrix elements of D, which we could call G, I, J, evaluated on any orthonormal basis sets we like, the sum of the modulus squared of these matrix elements is the same as the sum of the modulus squared of the singular values. And we can usefully write this as a sum rule S. This sum rule is important below for many reasons. It can be evaluated without solving the problem, and it gives a limit on the number and strength of connections. All of this may be simpler to understand if we construct some simple examples. So we imagine we have our source volume, our coupling operator, and our receiving volume, and we can see how this works first for a finite number of point sources and receivers. So for example, loudspeakers at positions RS1, RS2, RS3, and so on in the source volume, and microphones at positions RR1, RR2, and RR3, and so on, in the receiving volume. Using the Green's function, we can construct the resulting matrix to represent GSR. So let's consider three sources and receivers. A set of source points, which we could think of as loudspeakers, a set of receiving points, which we could think of as microphones. There's some separation between them. Here we've chosen that as just five wavelengths, and the sources themselves and the receiving points are separated just by two wavelengths. For these source and receiving points, then we can simply use this Green's function to calculate all the matrix elements. It's straightforward. And that gives a matrix that looks like this, presuming unit wavelength for simplicity here. This contains all the coefficients coupling the source points to the corresponding receiving points. Note incidentally that the sum of the modulus squared of the matrix elements in this matrix is the relevant sum rule here, so we get a specific answer for that, a specific number. With this matrix, the orthogonal eigenvectors of g dagger g are these three vectors, and the corresponding eigenvectors of g g dagger are these three vectors. And in this symmetric problem, these happen to be the complex conjugates of the source vectors, though that is not generally the case. So, these solutions that we have here are essentially unique. There is only one set of such orthogonal channels. The modes, then, are these complex drive and receive vectors, not the beam in between the sources and receivers. It's these vectors that are the solutions of the eigenproblems. These are the modes. The modulus squared of the singular values are the power coupling strengths in this problem. So these numbers here that we get from that eigenproblem. So we see, first of all, that the channels are not all equally strongly coupled. These numbers are somewhat different. Note, incidentally, that the sum of these power coupling strengths 
is the same number we got before by adding up the modulus squared of all of the matrix elements. So the coupling strengths of these channels use up the sum rule. How would we use a communications mode? Well, the idea is that a given source vector gives the relative amplitudes and phases to drive the three loudspeakers to drive a particular communications mode channel. So this vector of relative complex amplitudes here. And a given receiving vector gives the relative amplitudes and phases for adding up the signals from the microphones to receive a given communications mode channel. So we add up the microphone outputs with these complex amplitudes. This would give us the first channel in both cases here. Optics, of course, does not easily have directly controlled point sources and receivers, but recent work with meshes of Mach Zender interferometers allows us to construct arbitrary vectors of superimposed amplitudes from separate sources. So we can construct these vectors we've been talking about also in optics. What this source mesh can do is it can take an individual input channel and construct an arbitrary vector of output amplitudes, here just shown as light emerging directly from waveguides. And similarly, this second input here can construct another orthogonal vector of amplitudes that come out here, and so on for the third one. So this can generate our point sources, as it were, from an individual channel, and we can have three different orthogonal such vectors of outputs here. Similarly, this receiving mesh can take vectors of inputs and it can sort them out one by one to these output channels. We can continue to look at larger problems with more source and receiver points. In this paper, there is a variety of examples, including ones with larger numbers of points and with one-dimensional, two-dimensional and three-dimensional source and receiver volumes. Here we have two vertical lines of sources, but very close together, but this is for a technical reason to eliminate backward waves for graphic clarity. This line of sources is over here. And we have a single line of receivers. The line of receivers is over here. But now we have 97 of each of these. The dimensions here mean we are approximately paraxial. The picture we are showing here shows the cross section of the intensity in the plane. Here, for what is actually the most strongly coupled communications mode in this system. So let's look at a set of these modes, one after the other. I'm going to show you all of the odd modes in this system. So here's the most strongly coupled one. And on the right, we're showing the magnitudes of the power coupling strength, so the modulus squared of the singular values, as a percentage of the sum rule. So this first one takes over just 8% of the sum rule. The next one, mode 3, also takes a rather similar fraction of the sum rule. The next one, similarly, mode 7, mode 9. And by mode 11, we're just starting to see that the wave is missing the receivers. So here, the wave is just about to begin to miss the receivers, and we see a slight fall off in the strength of the coupling. There are more modes here. Here's mode 13, and we see this phenomenon of the wave missing the receivers getting stronger. And if we go to mode 15, we see the coupling is very weak. And we can look at that on a logarithmic scale as well. It does exist, but we see it's mostly on this figure here, missing the receivers. It's not totally missing the receivers. There's still a very small amplitude in the middle here that we can't see on this scale. And if we go up to higher modes, we see the coupling strength falling off exponentially fast. This paraxial problem then does show a number of strongly coupled modes that are all approximately equally strongly coupled and up to what we could call a paraxial heuristic number, NHY here. It's about 12 in this case. This paraxial heuristic number corresponds to our usual ideas of a diffraction limit, by the way. And we can call this approximate equality of the coupling strengths paraxial degeneracy. Note that this communications mode approach allows us to count the number of usable channels for communicating with optics. The results here are quite definite and communications modes are unique. 
Once we have chosen the optical system, we have the answer to what are all the orthogonal channels for communication. Other than for accidental degeneracies, we get no more choice as to the orthogonal channels. We cannot create any additional orthogonal channels that are more strongly coupled than these. It's quite straightforward to extend this discussion to two-dimensional surfaces, and I won't go through the detail here, but we can state the result. It's quite simple. It's the product of the two areas divided by the square of the separation and divided by the square of the wavelength. Let's look then now at a two-dimensional example, and one that deliberately is not really paraxial. The surfaces are too close here. We're going to take our surfaces as these areas here, a 16 wavelength square transmitter or source area and a 16 wavelength square receiving area. So we have two dimensional arrays of sources and receivers that are emulating the situation for the communications modes with these two surfaces. So here we are plotting the field at the receiver. That's what's shown on this picture here. And these dots show the area corresponding to the area of all of these dots here. And we're going to look at this for each one of the possible communications modes. We'll go through all of these, but what is going to happen is that we're going to get a set of different communications modes. But you see that the coupling strengths are quite different for these modes. Note the finite number then of usable channels in this system. So here then, explicitly, is the same mode we've just been looking at. This particular one, not surprisingly, happens to correspond to the most strongly coupled mode. It takes about 12% of the total available coupling strength. Here is the second mode, rather similar coupling strength, and the third mode, which is just a symmetry variation on the second one. And here's the fourth one. It looks substantially different, but it's approximately the same strength of coupling. Here's the fifth. We see much less coupling now. The sixth, a similar coupling to that previous one. Another two similarly coupled modes. And then here is mode 9. Here is mode 10. Here is mode 11. And we see in these modes that there's all sorts of interesting shapes about them, but they do not have all the same coupling strengths. Here's mode 12. So now we're down to 2.4% of the total compared to nearly 12% for the most strongly coupled mode. We can see in this example that we're getting modes that give field patterns that are reminiscent of conventional laser resonator modes. But the present modes are not the same as those idealized functions. And though we have 256 sources and receivers, we're only seeing 10 to 20 usable channels. And if we increase the number of sources and receivers, it would not change this number of usable channels. We can regard this limitation as in some way coming from diffraction, but it's not the same simple view of diffraction as we had with the paraxial case. It's also true here that there's a rather fundamental sum rule in this approach, which quite generally cuts off the number of usable channels. The area under the curves of the squared coupling strengths I've just been showing is quite directly limited. And for more details of this sum rule, see this reference, which is the major reference for this part of this talk. This approach here is not restricted to plane surfaces or lines. In fact, we can take any shape and we could have nanostructures, for example, and we could still figure out the communications modes. I'm showing an example here of a calculation where we have concentric spherical shells. So the sources lie on a little sphere here of two wavelengths diameter or four or eight, and the receivers lie on another sphere of diameter 24 wavelengths. The communications modes in this system are not quite like anything we would have expected, and I don't think there are prior calculations that show this kind of behavior we do get some kind of meaningful spherical heuristic number. This number corresponds to about one mode here for every square half wavelength on the inner sphere surface. And these connection strengths actually show a linear fall off, approximately speaking, or asymptotically, up to this spherical heuristic number. Now, I think we could probably figure out why that is, 
but it doesn't correspond with any of our previous views of what diffraction would do in a situation like this. There's also an exponential falloff after that number, and these exponential falloffs are still actually somewhat of a mystery. Now, so far I've shown you only examples for simple scalar fields, but it turns out that this approach extends to full vector fields. So for example, here I'm showing the mode coupling between a line of sources and a line of receivers. We have a conventionally polarized mode as an example here, which is number four. But this particular approach works out all the modes for all the polarizations. So it finds the two different kinds of polarizations in plane and out of the plane here. And also it even finds the modes corresponding to longitudinal polarization. Now that's not really a propagating mode, and in fact it decays very quickly. I've magnified the strength of it over here. But we can see that it does in fact exist, and this model can find it. That's just an illustration, but the point is this approach we've been taking can handle full electromagnetic situations, and hence we start to lose the distinction here between optics and radio frequency antennas, and indeed this approach will work perfectly well for looking at the modes of radio frequency systems too. This singular value decomposition approach to modes gives us sets of pairs of source and receiving functions. And these pairs are the true modes. These modes correctly define channels and correctly count them. They are subject to an underlying sum rule which limits the number and coupling strength even if we increase the number of sources, and even if we go to infinite number of sources, that is, continuous functions. These modes are unique, other than for symmetry degeneracies. They are the only sets of orthogonal source and receiver functions that couple one by one from source to receiver. These modes apply to conventional paraxial optics, reproducing the results we know, but they extend to other cases as well, including volumes and unusual shapes, and they extend also to full vector electromagnetics. Now we're going to take one further step in using these new ideas of modes from singular value decomposition in optics and show a new way of looking at optical systems quite generally. This approach is very powerful. For example, it lets us derive new fundamental laws in optics, and it relates quite closely to the ideas of using meshes of interferometers to implement arbitrary linear optical systems. So let's see how this works. Now we're going to look at the idea of singular value decomposition again, but for the more general case of a scatterer, optical device or object, described by some operator D. So instead of just having free space in here, we are allowing some other device. But whatever it is, we can describe it by a linear operator that maps from source functions to resulting wave functions. One immediate consequence is that because we can perform the singular value decomposition of any linear operator, we have what we can call the mode converter basis sets of functions. These are, first of all, a set of orthogonal source functions, so functions psi s, that lead one by one to a set of corresponding orthogonal received waves, phi r here. In turn, that means that there is a set of orthogonal channels through any linear scatterer. And these sets of channels are simply given by these mode converter input and output function pairs. This realization that any optical system can be represented using an orthogonal set of input functions that map one by one to an orthogonal set of output functions is quite a profound realization in optics. It leads to new fundamental results and a new way of making arbitrary optics. Now, we know that we can construct any unitary linear operator in optics using a mesh of interferometers. And we now know we can perform the singular value decomposition of any linear optical system, which decomposes it mathematically into a product of three operators, a unitary operator, a diagonal operator, and another unitary operator. Can we take one more step and emulate any linear operator with interferometer meshes? Well, here is the architecture that we think can do this.
First of all, here we have a kind of mesh of interferometers we've already seen. It can take any four inputs here, orthogonal input vectors, and line them up to come out in single waveguides. What we have over here is the same thing. I've flipped it upside down for compactness, but it's just the same kind of object. We can think of this one as doing the opposite. It takes light in a waveguide here and turns it into a specific vector of outputs here. Light in the second waveguide, it turns into another orthogonal set of vectors here, and so on for the third and fourth waveguides. And we've also added a set of modulators in the middle that can modulate amplitude and phase on these waveguides as they go through. So, the self-aligning input coupler mesh on the left can couple any four orthogonal inputs, each to different signal waveguides in the middle, to so these waveguides in here. This is a first arbitrary unitary matrix multiplication. The amplitude and phase of this conversion can then be controlled by the modulators in the middle. These modulators are implementing the singular values. They're the strengths of the connections. Light in these single waveguides now, emerging from those modulators, can be converted into any four orthogonal outputs on the right by self-aligning the output coupler mesh on the right, if we like. This is the second arbitrary unitary matrix multiplication. So the optical units in this mesh implement the singular value decomposition of some operator D. And for an optical system of a given dimensionality, we can therefore emulate any operator D, and hence any linear optical system. Note we are implementing an arbitrary linear optical component by constructing it using its mode converter basis sets. The input mode converter basis functions are the ones that are converted to light in single waveguides here in the middle. The output mode converter basis functions are the ones generated as a result of light in one of these waveguides giving us an output vector, and so on for each of these different input waveguides to our output coupler system here. The coupling strengths from the input to output mode converter modes are the singular values as implemented by the modulators in the middle. Obviously, if the singular value is to have a magnitude greater than 1, we would have to add some amplification in here as well. This is the first proof that any linear optical component is possible in principle and that any linear optical system can be factored into a set of two beam interferences. The proof here is that we've shown you how you can do it. The fact that we can now, in principle, make any linear optical component at a given frequency means that we can do thought experiments based on that. I don't have time to discuss these here, but we can, for example, use this approach to prove new and extended versions of Kirchhoff's radiation laws and Einstein's A and B coefficient argument that I mentioned earlier. As I said, these new laws apply only and uniquely to these mode converter basis sets, though they prove results that apply more generally as well. This approach also allows a convenient quantization of the electromagnetic field without the usual arbitrary boxes we typically use in such proofs, so it has some quite interesting fundamental aspects to it. So, here I have tried to show that there is a unified and powerful new way to look at optics. It correctly defines the real modes of optical systems, it works for the optics we knew, but it also works well beyond that for nanostructures and volumes. And at the same time, with the same mathematics, we are also able to define arbitrary optical components. This mathematics also maps to the new kinds of programmable optics that we can now make. And indeed, those optics are one of the ways that we can now control these new modes that we understand. So indeed, we do have new and powerful tools for understanding optics, which are going to help us as we move into this new world of complex and controllable optical nanostructures, devices and systems. I'm very pleased to acknowledge my funding from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and thank you very much for your attention.